Hi everybody, here we are again. Welcome back to the Woodworking Wisdom Workshops. I'm Colin Way. Um, today we're going to look at some toys or rattle and uh, some spinning tops. Um, two sessions a week this week, so it's quite nice. Back to the old forms, back to what we were doing before Christmas. Um, so rattles and spinning tops. So there's, if you say toys, you can throw numerous projects at a, a demonstration just called toys but i thought let's do a couple of really really simple ones and and quick ones as well um certainly baby's rattles they give me a chance to demonstrate to show you captive ring tools and beading tools we're also going to use those tools next week on the tuesday as well where we're going to do, uh, do a beaded bowl um but i thought it'd be good to get the captive ring tools out have a play with them show them what's going on and everything show you what's going on with those and how they work in terms of the spinning tops we'll get some spinning for you in a minute but that's going to give us a chance also to play with color um to use the things like the decorating elf um, and again, we'll show you that's a texturing tool. Um, I, I just a, a chance to play and answer some of the questions that you've been talking about in previous sessions. So there's been lots of requests coming in, and these are two of the sort of the, the most requested. So here we are. This is the rattle that we're going to do. So nice little baby's rattle. There we are. We'll show you that one. So there's the captive rings. So obviously, we're going to make two ends bigger than the central hole of the actual captive rings there. Um, and what we've got to make sure, of course, is with a rattle that there's no sharp edges. You think about babies putting this in their mouths, make sure there's nothing that they can hurt themselves on. Um, and the timber's actually hard enough that it's not going to break when uh, when they start mouthing it. So no finish on this one, by the way. We'll talk finishes. I'm sure there'll be a few questions about finishes um, on these as we go through. But this is just bare. This particular piece of timber is a bit of ash. Um, but yeah, we're going to use a, a couple of different timbers today. So that's first project. So let's get to, to starting. Pretty much a between sensor project, this one. Um, there's no uh, chuck work as such um, in the making of this. We're going to use a chuck just to clean up uh, the ends later on, and that'll just be to hold um, a sanding disc. But apart from that, um, it's just going to be turning between centers. So we'll get started. We're going to start with a roughing gouge first, spin a roughing gouge. So this one's a, a 19 mil, so three quarter roughing gouge. Um, and all we're going to do, just knock the corners off. We will have some dust extraction going. The, the, all the timber that we're using on these projects today is dry timber. So there's no wet timber going on. It's all dry. Um, and so we are going to get a little bit of dust. So dust extraction will be on at some point. There we are. We're hopefully, we're going to keep our focus nicely on our cameras. Just before I start turning, though, we're just going to answer a, a question. Yes, and by the way, we've got Steph on questions today. We've got Ben on cameras. Hi, Colin. Uh, Paul is asking um, that you talked in the past about covering the Boucher dolls in the form of an Easter egg, possibly. Oh, yeah. Would these be turned in the same way that Jason did the lidded box? They're very much so, yeah. I mean, the, the only difference I would say with those, um, they tend to be turned from um, timber... Um, so branch section timber. So if they shrink, they shrink together like you would a lampshade, for instance. Um, or well, that's what my research has told me. Um, a bone dry um, to fit inside each other. We will do them. Obviously, East has been and gone now. We, we will do them. We'll do, but I'm not going to do that many inside each other because um, I've never done them before. Um, but we will have a play. We'll we'll do that in a future session, probably around about sort of June, July time. And um, we'll have a go at those. Okay. Excellent. Right. No better time to try something for the first time than when you're in a camera, in front of a camera. So here we go. Uh, we're just going to rough down, knock the corners off. By the way, this is a piece of um, uh, really, really hard ash. Okay, there we are, down to around. I'm going to give you some measurements in a minute. Yes, Steph. 
Uh, so somebody's asking quickly about the wood turning courses. Are there any coming back? We haven't got any dates at the moment as to when they come back. Um, and if so, what sort of uh, format they're going to run at. Um, we know that they're not going to be as many as we used to do. Um, but whether they come back in any number, we, we just have to wait and see, really. So at the moment, I have no information for you at, at this stage. Um, this one's been put in in three parts, so I'll have to try and piece it together. Um, Eric's asking a uh, question about hollowing bowls. He owns the same lathe as this one. Yeah. His workshop shop is a bit small, uh, so he often rotates the headstock to 45 degrees from the bed and then uses a bowl gouge to hollow. It seems safe and he's never had any issues, but uh, just wanted to know your thoughts on safety for what he's doing at home. On, on safety, you're doing the right thing. So hollowing out the inside of a regular bowl with a bowl gouge is exactly what we, what we do all the time. I mean, that is the right tool for the job. Um, if hollow forms, then you might want to go to something like, I, I demonstrated a couple of weeks ago, uh, oh, something like one of these. Which is the um, the woodcut uh, uh, pro master, um, but no, you're doing exactly the right thing in terms of your own health and safety. Then the obvious things may not be obvious actually. Um, eye protection, um, face protection. Now I'm wearing um, goggles so you can hear what I'm saying, but at home I wear a full face shield um, that supplies air to me as well. So your lungs, your eyes, your ears. A lot of people forget about ears, or actually, when I'm on my own. I've got a set of ear protectors that go over my, my mask. Dust extraction, we spoke about that on Tuesday. Really, really important to have dust extraction. Um, uh, you know, all those regular things, tying back your hair, making sure jewellery is not going to dangle in the way, all those sorts of stuff. So in terms of um, your own health and safety, those are the recommendations, yes. Uh, he's put also, um, again, Eric, he's mo more referring to the rotating of the headstock. Is uh, that safe to do? No problem at all. In, in fact, I've done tabletops by rotating this all the way down and used a floor stand to do the turning with. So there's no problem at all. It locks um, absolutely fine. I was doing it only this morning, doing some hollow forms where I had it on a 45 degree angle hollowing. You've got no issues. In fact, if I'm doing bigger, so I've, if, this is 16 inches here. If I've got an 18 inch bowl, what I'll do is rotate the other way, have the tool rest here, skim the outside edge first and then if i can bring it back i'll bring it back so yeah absolutely no problem with that just make sure it's locked down properly that's all uh we've got maria in wales not a turning question but one about selling is it actually legal to sell these rattles and toys selling stuff for kids seems to be a minefield of legal issues yeah it does so you're gonna have to do your research i have not um, looked into that at all. What I've looked into is wood toxicity, wood toxicity, um, and paint finishes. Now, when it comes to finishes, you'll have several guidelines on the the tin. There'll be toy safe, there'll be food safe. Toy safe is fine for um, for uh, toys if they're going to be put in the mouth. So once dry, then they've been deemed safe to use. This sort of thing, I would um, personally. I wouldn't really put a finish on this. Again, I've looked, and what they recommend is the natural oils. So things like tongue oil, bear in mind it's a nut, uh, lemon oil, um, one of those, the natural oils, okay? Uh, walnut oil, again, it's a nut, so be careful. But I wouldn't put things on like um, uh, sanding sealers. I mean, shellac, it's a natural product again, but just check what other ingredients have gone into it. I would just keep them... Um, uh, fairly neutral. Well, I'm going to talk woods in a minute as well. Yes, sir. Uh, Woodwork Learner is asking, will you by chance be using one of your signature SKUs today? Of course we will. It's a, every session we will. Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, woods. This is ash. Beach is another good one. Um, uh, the, every time I've looked, everybody um, talks about fruit woods being good. Um, maple, sugar maple, that sort of stuff. That's that's all fine. Things I've steered clear of um, are things with tannic acid in, so things like oak. Um, use a definite no. Laburnum is a definite no. Um, but olives. Now, we had a conversation earlier about using olive, but it's got a lot of tannic acid in. It's very oily timber. I wouldn't have thought it tastes very nice for a start, um, but I wouldn't have thought there's going to be it's gonna be that safe. Now, I have heard walnut. Um, being used, but then um, afterwards, a little sub line saying, but it's mildly toxic. So for me, that anything that says toxic when it comes to toys, just steer clear of it. 
Okay. Um, Martin wants to know what you're tanning with at the moment. The, so this timber here is ash. This is a really dense bit of ash, this bit. And then uh, Rick's asking a question about lemon oil. Um, I've never used it, but was wondering how long the lemon smell lasts. Um, well, there's nothing I've measured, really. I would have thought it's quite a while. I mean, it is... It, Certainly, if it's anything like um, the the organ oils that I've used, then the the lemony smell lasts for well forever, really. Um, but it's a natural oil, so what you'd have to do, especially if it's on a food product, is reapply quite often, um, just like you would a, a wok with oil. If once you've used it and you've washed it, you reapply uh, reapply some oil. I would say the same on that. If it's a salad bowl or a chopping board, just keep applying it every every few uses. Give it another sort of bring it back to life sort of thing. Uh, Terry would like to know what about hazel. Hazel, I have researched it, Terry. I don't know. I haven't looked for looked at hazel, but have a look. Um, look, the, there's plenty of of information on uh, wood toxicities, um, and so yeah, just pop it in Google, and there, there, that'll tell you. Could you use sapili? Sapili, I probably would steer no, away. Sorry, sorry Terry, I, I'd steer away from sapili only because it's quite splintery, um, and you know, for obvious reasons, we don't want that. All right. Yeah, they're taking bets again on whether you're going to use your skew chisel. At what minute we're going <laughs> to use the skew chisel? Well, I'll tell you what we could do. If we go to camera two, let's just clean that finish up. I wouldn't normally clean the finish up, but as as you're humouring me, why not? Bevel rubbing, lift the handle, and then we're going to run along that surface to give us a nice clean finish. And then we can do the same from the other way. Rub the bevel, lift the handle. There we are. That's just going to give us a nice clean finish ready to start shaping with. So there's your, there's a, a small section of skew work going on. We've got a lot more to do, of course. So let's round over one end. I'm going to use a parting tool first, though. Um, let's go with a fairly big parting tool. I'm just going to give myself enough material to clean off at the end. This is a very thing I sort of forget a lot of the time. So I want to leave enough material to be able to take away any holding point that we might have had there. So where the where the centers are. There we are. Let's just that's that. So now we're going to round over our business end. Business end, all I mean by that is the end that we're going to start with. So just using the spindle gouge. And we can bring, if you watch what I'm doing here, I'm rolling the gouge over. And then to give myself a little bit more movement, I'm bringing the handle around. Once I finish this project, I'm just going to put a little cent a smaller center in there to take off that bit of waste. Um, we'll do that at the end. This side's going to be a bit smaller. Just tidy up that end just a little bit and round over. So both of these tools I'm using, the spindle gouge and the skew then, are being used with their bevel rubbing. And you'll hear bevel rubbing an awful lot. You certainly hear it from me a lot. And the bevel is the bit that stops the chisels from catching. If you use a cutting edge only, the cutting edge isn't limited and it'll want to just dive into the workpiece all the time. There we are. Yes, Steph. Um, so we've got a question from James Mason here. It's a general question about lathes. He hasn't bought a wood turning lathe yet, but he's looking at the Axminster ones and even the AT350 is um, only 400 <coughs> mil between centres. Is that enough? He's seen some on eBay that are 1,000 mil between centres. Yeah, so we, the, the if you're looking at a craft machine, the and I can't remember what the number, um, the code for it is, but we do a floor standing um, 1,100 between centers. Um, so that might be worth a look. 
But most of the benchtop machines also have a bed extension. So it might be worth having a look at that because that obviously will, well, not obviously, but it will double the bed length for you. So it might be worth having a look at that as well. Look for the bed extensions as well. Okay, we've got a question from Woodmum Guitar. Can you explain the difference between the AC355 and the AC370 lathe? 370, so the 370, I think I'm right here. 370 is the floor standing machine. 355 is the bench bench machine. So the uh, and the differences really are in the length of the machine. So the the um, 370 is like I say 1100 between centers. Um, I'm not quite sure the 355, but it's it's a lot less than that. I think it's probably around about another probably about 400 shorter, maybe. I'd, I'd have to double check that. But it's a bench machine as opposed to a floor standing machine. Um, you're also, the other thing, the 355 has an electronic variable speed. The floor standing, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, 370 um, has a mechanical variable speed. So both um, uh, variable speed, but one's mechanical, one's uh, electronic. Go to number two there, Ben. So this is where we are at the moment. Look, this the two curve surfaces. You can see the different curves. So now we can start working on the captive rings themselves. So I want to keep with that diameter for the external part of the, the rings. And we're looking now at these two tools. So we've got a beading tool. And don't forget, next week I'm going to do a bowl with the beading tool itself here. Um, and we're just going to decorate the outside of a bowl. So just wanted to show you a couple of different ways of using it on faceplate and on uh, between center work. Um, so we're going to start the bead with this, the beading tool, and then I'm going to actually make the ring captive by using the, the captive ring tool here. They're both scraping tools, um, and this is just a hook to get behind the back of the, the ring as we form it. So we can start with the beading tool, and I'm going to start fairly close, so about here. But I'm not going to go that far. About there, that's marked the bead. So now I'm going to go back to a passing tool, and I'm going to cut beside it. There's no point making this hard work. So cut beside it, give myself plenty of room, both sides. Because I'm gonna need to get in there in a minute with the beading tool, or the captive ring tool, sorry. I want to give myself plenty of room. So there we are, now this is scraping for us. Now, we could just stop there at that point but why not, whilst we've got it, just bring it round to start forming the back of that bead. Come round the other way, do exactly the same thing. There we go. So we've got quite a lot of that formed already. Now we can go to the, to the captive ring tool. Let's just take a little bit more of the material away with the parting tool. Be quite careful when you pop this tool in because it's quite easy to scratch the bead that you've formed. Nice and patient. Let the tool do the work and then back out. Nice and careful again. Taking my time. You can now see the benefit of creating this bit of clearance here because I'm bringing that handle right the way around. And we are, there's our first little captive ring there, look. Yes, Steph. So we've had um, essentially a couple of questions about the captive ring tool. So Martin and Frederick, uh, asking how would you how would you sharpen the captive tool and um, can you show them? Yep. So both of them are done with a diamond file. So I never touch the important surface. This one here. It's all done up here. Give that a nice sharpen. Keep it sharp. Don't wait for it to go blunt. 
And the same thing here, this is a double edged tool. So you can see as the same cutting surface on both edges. So again, same thing, bring the file to the tool and just sharpen that edge, both sides. Really important to keep it sharp. Basically, they're big negative rake scrapers. All right. Yes. Um, Mark would like to know what height the tool rest is at to use these tools. Please. Okay. Well, essentially, they're scraping tools, so it's just below center. Um, I can't. It's not measured, but I'm probably about three mil below center there. Um, that means that I can lift the handle. The the width. The thickness of the steel puts the tool um, roughly on center point, just but with a gentle lift of the handle um, and just a gentle approach. Don't push too hard with them. Nice and sharp. Push gentle. Be patient with them. Let them work. Yeah. And um, what speed are you going? Speed. Speed, we're looking at 15, 1,600 revs. And um, somebody's asking, do we sell chisels? I'm assuming we do. We do. The links are on the video. So the, the links are already there for you. So have a look. Um, and Lily, if you would maybe highlight the links for us, that'd be grand. So I'm just doing another clearance cut. And then we'll do another one. Let's do three beads. I'll whip through this one. So there we are. We're going to come all the way around. myself a little bit more space here look so nice and patient go in nice and gentle as well try to avoid scratching Again, going careful. Here we are, job done. Let's just have a look at those. I've noticed already on this one here, we've left a little bit of timber so that should just pop out. What I will do, what I will do once we've cleared some of this waste away, is just a bit of paper on the inside edge. And of course, you could sand these before they're released as well. But at the moment, we've got them floating in there just how we want them. I am going to stop at two. I'm not going to go to another one because I want to fit in some spinning tops for you as well, don't forget. So I'm going to get to finish this one now. Yes, Steph. You just preempted one of the questions, actually. David asked, before the final cut to release the ring, do you not sand? Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, and Woodman Guitar has also asked, um, what the difference between electronic or mechanical speed variation and what's the advantage between the two? Okay, electronic is what I've got here. So it's where I'm running the lathe, which is a three-phase motor, but it's running through an inverter to make it able to be worked through uh, a, a normal 13-amp supply. Um, but that means that I can use a, a variable speed unit. So I'm actually changing the speed of the motor with the variable speed here. Okay, so it's moving up and down. I can move from eight, 200 there all the way up to my 16 and beyond and below, of course. Mechanical, you're changing the speed of the main shaft alone. The motor speed is constant. Generally, it's about 1,400 revs of motor speed on, on a mechanical variable speed. And when you move a lever, you're moving pulleys. Pulleys intertwine. The lever moves the pulleys like this, and in between the pulleys runs the belt. So the belt then raises and lowers with those pulley movements. So that's how you get the main shaft um, changing speed without the motor changing speed. So that's the difference, mechanical and variable. Okay, let's take some of this um, excess away. So rough and gouge first. I'm going to keep the captive rings where they are just for the moment. Well, 
what you've got to think of are those little hands that are going to be grabbing this. Um, so don't keep things too chunky. You want to have some nice areas where they can hold. So a little spindle gauge, just refining that shape. There we are. That looks okay. Now I'm just going to see if I can bring these captive rings both over. Lovely. So that side's done. Now I'm not going to sand, but you would now you would sand that first, then bring these over um, before you start working on this bit. I'm not going to bother about the sanding. You don't need to just sit there and watch me sand. So we're just going to take these back out the way. Let's get rid of that. Just going to take these back just to keep them out the way out of out of the way whilst I just clean up that other bit and that'll be taken off in a minute make sure that spins fine yeah and then we can start cleaning this area up now I'm going to make it a nice soft edge again we don't want to don't want to have it horrible and sharp like that so back with spindle gouge go perfect opportunity to get the skew out there we go yes Steph Terry is wondering what size the ash was at the start We'll get some measuring going in a minute. It was actually quite a lot larger than I needed. It was around about two by two, so 50 mil square. And we've ended up at its widest point, which is up here. It looks to be about 40. So we've ended up with it, oh no, a lot bigger than that, 45 mil at its widest point. And if we take away the bits that I'm going to sand off in a minute, so it's 140 mil long finished. Okay, so the actual blank started 155. All right. There we are. So let's say I've sanded that now. We've finished. It's all sanded. It's all looking lovely. We can then take this away and we'll also no i'm going to leave that on i'm just going to change that center what am i doing we need to just get rid of some of that some of that bulk off of there look so let's change the center over and i'll just use a friction drive we'll just go with a small friction drive that can be as simple as a little ring center like that just to just to take away as much as we can before we have to sand so that can go in there. You could, of course, just swap it round, just turn it over. But this is just as easy. I'll just parting tool this. A little bit of a side scrape. There we go. So now I'm going to leave that on there until we finish the sanding. Okay. So if I just declutter, get rid of some of these tools a minute. There we are. I'm sure we're going to use the skew again. So you will come back out. Let's get the sanding disc on. So to get the sanding disc working, I'm just going to put my chuck on 
with some C jaws in them. Really useful. I think mean, someone was asking a couple of weeks ago about um, tidiness and tool storage and things like that. When you're working in the workshop, I found it as in, in production um, work as well, to have everything in a place um, and to know where that place is. The, you're amazing how tidy you keep your workshop if everything has its own little place to be um, because things don't get cluttered and left on the bench or that sort of stuff. So when you see sort of reaching for certain things, it's because this is very much like my workshop at home, as you may have seen. And so I know where everything is, and it's just easy to keep everything tidy and safe and all that sort of stuff. So if there's any advice I can give us at all, it's keep your work shop safe and find a place for everything and if you haven't used it in a in two or three years get rid of it okay let's have a bit of dust extraction so started at zero then we're at the speed up i'm running there at 800 revs we've got here that's a, a 100 grit um uh, disc what i would not normally do now is go to one of the rotary sander heads so use one of these in my pin jaws because i can use these down to 400 grit so if i've got that held in the chuck then i can use 400 grit and clean those other bits that we've used that numerous times you see me do that quite a lot but that's really quite useful the fact that these come out of the um the the bowl sander um, and you can put them in your chuck and use them so it just means that you've got extra grits you can use because trying to find a 400 grit for a big disc grinder like that is almost impossible so there we are that's that's would have been if we had sanded it all over our little baby's rattle completed keeps me out of um, Keeps me occupied for hours anyway. Um, but there we are. Nice and simple. That's the captive ring tool um, in conjunction with the beading tools. Really quite nice, quite fun tools, toys to make. Um, like I say, keep them natural. I wouldn't paint them because then you've got to worry about toxicity of paints and all those sorts of things. Yes, Steph? Um, Terry's asked, uh, would it be an idea to have a stop to stop the rings coming back and hitting the baby's hands? Well... <sighs> I, you know, I don't think so, really, because they're so, so light. They're, they're, there's nothing. I don't think there's anything to hurt, really. But, yeah, absolutely. You can put another flare there if you wanted. So you have a handle separately and then another flare. So they, they sort of stay at one side. Yeah, no problem. It's uh, entirely up to you. Okay, so now let's have a look at spinning tops. We're going to just rough down some timber first to get it to the right size to hold it in a chuck. We're going to use a different set of jaws this time. And use some of the big old dip. Well, not big, actually. They're a big bit of metal, but they're small jaws. This is the ODs, the OD 112s, these are. So they're um, internal grip is a dovetail external grip is a dovetail they're just nice they throw the work piece away from the chuck because they've got this extended nose here so we're going to use those to grip but first of all i need to prep the timber so roughing it down um and i've got a couple of different timbers here that i'm just going to quickly rough down first of all shall we just have a look at some of these spinning tops that we've made earlier at work whilst i'm asking quest answering questions a second let's get my board in position Good. Yes, Steph, go for it. Uh, we've got Malcolm here. He's got the AC118CE extractor. Um, if he places it in another room, is there a switch system for it so that it can be started and stopped from the workshop? We do switching systems for dust extractors. 
whether it works for that one, I'm not sure. Would you be able to just email that question into the Woodworking Wisdom uh, email and um, I'll research it and tell you for sure, okay? So we're just going to hold a piece of timber between centers. This is going to be a little spinning top. Um, but first of all, I just want to get the board on there and just get a couple spinning. Is that a good position, Ben? Yeah. So these are just a few that I've done in prep for today. Okay, so we've got some a couple of different finishes actually. So we've got just an airbrushed one here. So a couple of different colors, red and red and black. Then we've got the um, this is the decorating elf um, marking. So we've got the front and the back um, used with the decorating elf. I've got a, a, a blue dye or wood stain on there, and then we've just picked out that those decorations with some liming wax. This is a similar sort of thing, decorating uh, elf on the top but then a uh, black spray on the top there. And then we've used some of the embellishing waxes from um, Hampshire Sheen. So com completely different um, finishes, but they all give their own very unique look. Not number three, Ben, just to prove that they are moving. All right, so that's what we've got to do. And that's the, um, that's the mark of uh, uh, that they work as long as you can demonstrate them if you're in front of people then they they're good to go i like doing these as a demonstration especially remember those days when we used to be able to meet up in big groups and do woodworking shows and things like that um these are lovely little demonstration pieces that you can just throw out into the crowd just give to anybody that's walking by um i mean the kids love them and uh take your seconds to make really really quick i'm going to go about about two thousand revs just to rough these down About 45 mil on these, but you can go a lot smaller. Um, you can go a lot bigger, but just, just be aware that the bigger you go, the harder they are to, to start off in the first place and to stay stable. And we want to keep that center of gravity low as well. And the smallest little point on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the business end. So we want as, as little friction as possible. So there we are. That's down to round. I'm just going to, with the aid of a skew chisel, just put a little dovetail. And I think that'll do. I've got one already done. So I think that's uh, got a nice piece of sycamore there already done as well. So that should be enough for our demonstration. Yes, Steph? Avoid asking, have you tried to turn the tippy tops? No. Oh, I know what you mean. The spinning tops that flip up the other way. I haven't. No. Um, it'd be interesting to, to do. I've seen them used. I've seen them seen people make them but i've never given them a go myself tippy tops i'm guessing it's what um so they're a spinning top that once you spin it it'll turn itself up the other way and actually spin on its um its handle so upside down basically there we are right um od 112s mcdonald draws and this is it's just a chance to have a bit of fun on the lathe. We've got, to decorate this, I've got several things over there. I've got an airbrush, or several airbrushes, but also got, oh, I haven't done that very well. I haven't cleaned up the edge. Um, airbrush, I've got paint pens, we've got embellishing waxes, liming waxes, spirit stains, all sorts of stuff. So you can play around with whatever you want. Um, this is fun in many ways because it, it, you're also you're also decorating and just experimenting and playing with with color right there we are so we're going to start this is going to be the bottom of our first 
spinning top. 1,500 well, 1500 revs. And we've got a spindle gouge at the moment. Just shearing off that edge. Now, at the moment, look, there is, I don't know whether you can pick that up, there's a little tiny hole where the tail stock was. So we just got to turn a little bit away to get rid of that. I think one more. Nice and sharp. Let's just do one more cut there. Nice, sharp point. Okay, so that's the back end. Now, whilst we've got that there, let me just show you the simplest form of decoration that we can do on these. And the simplest form would be something like paint pens. These paint pens you can get anywhere. Most supermarkets, um, stationers. This is um, this is Pinter. This one, the Pilot Pinter. And these are little paint pens. They work really, really well. They're such vibrant colors. Um, just to show you what I mean by that, if you look. They're really, really pretty colors, these. But if we have the lathe running at a very, very slow speed, you can create spirals and all sorts. So let's just play around with one. Let's get a nice bold color in the middle and just come on out. And you can mix your colors up, of course. There we are. So just playing around with this sort of stuff. So a spiral on a spinning top works really, really well. Um, I'm going to take that away now because I want to show you what a what a bit of liming wax will do. And we will reuse the paint pens again on the little handle. Right, so there we are. Yes, Steph. Sorry, I didn't see. All right, we've got Antropogo. He's not a toy-related question. Uh, but which pro drive size would you recommend if you could only choose one? Uh, 16 mil. 16 mil. Um, yeah, all day. That reflects the sort of work I'm doing. Um, if I'm doing lots of big stuff, then obviously go with a bigger one, definitely. All right. Yes. Um, what is the best way or tool to tell what your bevel is on your turning gouge? That's from Vicky. Um, uh, so, yeah, your angle checker, your... Well, I, I'm using the Tormac angle checker all the time, the TTS 100, um, because I've got the Tormac. Uh, in terms of... Let me have a look. Let me have a look. Again, pop that question down to Woodworking Wisdom um, on the emails uh, to Woodworking Wisdom, and I'll um, I'll have a look around. I use the, the TTS 100 all the time, which is the Tormek um, tool set. Ben, would you pass that one? Just happens that I've got one just there. A lovely job. Okay, so that's the TTS 100. Now this is this is a, a turning aid that we use, um, or sharpening aid that we use when we're setting up our, our chisels to to grind. Um, now there's my 55 degree bevel angle. You see, so all I do is to check them. I just pop that up there. And you can see, or oh, let me go for a bigger gouge. All, all mine in here are set to 55 degrees, so you can see that that's matching the 55 degree bevel angle there. When you get a gouge for the first time, I would expect it to be a, a little bit more than that. Um, but if you go then to um, to my spindle gouges, you'll see that it's 45 degrees. So that's 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 one I use all the time because it does so many other things for me. It sets up my jigs on my um, sharpening system. It finds my um, angles and it also um, gives me clearance from the bar to the wheel as well. So that's the one I use. But yeah, if you want to know a bit more, if I, if you don't have a Tormek or not interested in Tormek stuff, then just send that as an email and I'll, I'll have a look around for you. Yes. Going back to the pro drive question, um, yes. Donna, she's in the US. Um, so she says that they don't use metric measurements. So 60 mil is more than inches or um, yeah, so 16 mil is just over the 5 eighths. Just over the 5 eighths, yeah. All right. 
Um, and you can get them in the US at the moment. We're, we're selling through um, woodturningstore.com up in New York. Um, they're a mail order company. Look, at, look them up and you can get all those, that gear from them. Okay. Okay, well, I was just going to do some messing around with the decorator now. If I'm going to do them on this side, because we've got a camera strategically placed to see that. So I've got a little um, radius cutter here, and this is full of teeth. And all I'm going to do is just hold it against an area with a fair amount of pressure. I'll do two. We are. Now, I don't know whether you can see that. You will in a minute. Let's now pop a little bit of color on there. If I go with a dark black, so if I use an airbrush just to quickly spray that. Yes, Steph? We've got, Jake. We've got James here asking, what bevel angle is your signature skew out of the box? Uh, it should be around about 25 degrees. Single bevel, 25 degrees. So this is a bit of black. Should we use black? Uh, no, let's let's go a bit brighter. Let's go. We'll go a blue. Oh, I like the blue and white. You don't have to use an airbrush to put this on. You can put it on by hand. Um, it's just it's a little bit cleaner for me to use the airbrush. I don't have to get the gloves on and I don't have to get blue hands, all that sort of stuff. Okay, so there we are. So now we've got a bold color. Let's go to the liming wax. We've got liming wax there. I'm going to play with um, some of the embellishing wax, the silver embellishing wax, the hamster sheen one in a minute as well. So we'll play with that. Different sort of effect that will give. So a little bit of tissue. Normally, I would be wearing gloves. Okay, I'm not going to. I'm going to skip that and just wash my hands afterwards. I don't think I'm going to get a huge amount on me. Uh, so we're going to all over. And quite simple then. We're going to just wipe it off. I'm going to do that with the lathe running. Now I just want to fill all those little marks. Now this is the, and the other thing here. If you're using a very coarse timber, something with a right, coarse grain structure, it will also um, stay in that grain. So you get a really quite a nice finish. There we are. So now you should see what that's done. We'll, we'll, we'll um, show the other camera in a second once we've actually got the spinning top off. But that's a lovely finish that you can get there. Base, base color first, and then fill the, the grooves with the waxes. Now that's white. Like I said, you've got all the embellishing waxes that are out there you could use. There we are. So we're going to take away some waste now. There'll be enough for another spinning top in this piece. Now, if you want to do anything to the, the front face, the face that you can't see, then now's the time. Because if we do it afterwards, what will happen, um, you're going to get a lot of vibration. Because in a minute, this little handle, the, 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 the bit that you actually spin, is going to be quite thin. So it's quite important that you do decorate now. I'm going to leave it for a minute. We're just going to use some paint pen to put some rings on the top. So this is a bowl gouge I'm using, a quarter inch or six mil bowl gouge. And we're going to use that sort of skew cut with the bowl gouge. So a skew cut is using the bottom of the gouge and we're bringing that cutting edge back just like you would a skew. Until finally we get down to enough that we can get the skew in there. 
and do that final bit. There we are. Yes, Dad. Okay, we've got Terry asking, are the waxes you're using toy safe? Safe for toys. Um, passes uh, uh, EN71, which EN71 is a test for heavy metals. <clears throat> loads and loads of tests they go through to check for heavy metals. But EN71 is the one that you're looking for. I will check the Hampshire Sheen. Liberon, yes. I'll check for Hampshire Sheen, though. But just check for EN71. We'll have it on our website. Hampshire Sheen will have it on their website. I can't see it on first glance, but again, we'll just, I'll have a check for you. So send that in as an email and I'll let you know. All right. We're almost there. I'm going to just tweak the end. You could sand if you wanted to. I won't. We're just going to put a little bit of color, put a hard edge on him there. Oh, let's go for it. I won't put a second colour on. You get carried away with this. So now we'll just part off. So make sure you're holding, especially if you've got your dust extractor on, make sure you're actually holding the top as you're... Oh, getting ink all over me. Holding this top as you turn them off. There we are. All right, so let's have a look at that. That top, you can see the effect that you get from the decorating elf there. Right, pretty one. Better test him before we do one more. He does work. There's the proof. <laughs> right, one more, and then what haven't we used yet? What haven't we used? Let's let's do a completely airbrushed one. So I am going to change that bit of timber. No point getting too close to the jaws when I've got another piece waiting here. <clears throat> yes. Um, I've had a message from Lily. Uh, she says that the the high gloss finishing wax from Hampshire Sheen is toy safe, um, and that's that's the ones that's toy safe from Hampshire Sheen. Right. Okay, there you go. So if you want to use some of the embellishing wax, it's probably best in that case. The liming wax is definitely toy safe. There we are. I'm just going to clean that up again. I've made the dovetail a little bit too deep, so it's bottoming out. Now, this is quite a dead piece of sycamore and what I mean by that is it's very very dry so it's not as clean as the as the um, ash was so you just need to be a little bit sharper with your cuts more precise crisper make sure you're slicing the timber not scraping Especially when it comes to that nice sharp point on the end there. Let's just stop and have a look and make sure that we're good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, happy with that. A nice rippled bit, actually. Um, we're going to airbrush this, so I'm not going to texture it in any way. So it doesn't really matter if I go right the way down to the handle now. So that's the start, okay? So we've taken away waste. That's given us room. To get the gouge in i'm using a bowl gouge to do this you could use a spindle gouge which i used on the front face no problem at all little slicing cuts much softer timber remember this one so I'm just going to be a little bit more cautious when it gets to the thin area.
Taking my time. So all I'm doing here is just preparing to round that over. I don't want to do too much rounding over just yet, though. Okay, so now let's get the airbrush going. I'm going to play around with a couple of colours. You know, really, these could be, these should be sanded, I suppose, to, to be honest. Um, but we're just going to go straight into it. So let's going to go my favourite colour now. I'm going to go red first. We're going to give you that that nice crisp edge. Oh, trying to pressure on that that's all burnt edge look so that's going to involve going hard with the red first bringing the spray or the the um the airbrush further back so i get a wider spray getting that really bold yes Steph. chris is asking at what moisture content percentage do you consider a wood to be dry well i mean i'm tending to go anything from 15 percent down um is a good dry timber you bear in mind that if you go if you're using uh, kiln-dried timbers, they're going to be down to about 12%. They're going to be quite dry and quite dusty, quite hard. So I quite like air-dried timbers because they don't go down quite as quite as extreme. The other thing to bear in mind with the kiln-dried timber, if you, the minute you leave it out in the atmosphere outside this time of year in the UK, it's quite damp, um, it will start absorbing moisture as well. So I tend to go air-dried air, air timbers, for me better anything from 15 percent down um and unless you're doing things like boxes of course where you'll need a rough turn even when it's at 15 percent um for the for the uh, fits but yeah from about that works so black on the the, the very tip here so i'm gonna go a little bit closer because i only want to touch the the edge of this piece We are, and we will do the handle as well. We'll have to just dab a little bit on the end when it's finished. There we are. We'll come back to that red in a minute. But let's part off. Get a better grip with that tool. So tip of the tool, hold on to the spinning top, pass them away. Okay, I'm just going to put a little dab of red on there before we carry on. So just a touch up. Again, the beauty of, a, of an airbrush. Yes, Steph. We've got an airbrushing question from Robert. We would like to know what that. What do you stand your airbrushes in? Airbrushes are stood in. Get this out. Maybe go. There's the finished. Sorry, Ben. Let's just go to that finished one first, and we'll get that spinning in a second. Um, my airbrushes are all stood in a very well used bit of timber. Okay, just with a, a load of holes drilled in it, works really, really well. Haven't um, didn't cost me a, a penny. All right. Yes, Steph. Um, Mike's uh, asking a question here. He took a delivery of his lathe today, and it came with the SK11, no, SK100 chuck. Should he have a tapered chuck like the one you're using, or will the SK100 do the same job? So the, it's safe. Yeah, absolutely. SK100 will come with C-jaws. Um, if you've watched many of these videos, you'll see me using the C-jaws pretty much 90% of the time. Um, yeah, it's just a different type of jaw. Um, the C jaw, which you have, will have um, a dovetail on the outside. Let me just grab a set to show you. They'll have a dovetail on the outside. So this is my SK114. You've got the 100 version. Um, but the, the jaws here, they're dovetailed at this point, but they've got a gripper's tooth on the inside. That's what you have. Okay, so absolutely fine. The jaws I'm using, I you see me travel around different sets for different applications, that's all. These are a good go-to set. These use all the faceplate rings, all this, the um, screw chucks, all those sorts of things. So you've got a good starter there. Yes, Steph. 
Frederick's asking, out of interest, what is, in your opinion, the worst wood that you don't like to turn with? I would done um, uh, the American Association of Wood Turners seminar um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they gave me um, a timber that was so fibrous, um, it was Rafus or Rufus, R-A-F-U-S, I think they called it. Um, and the minute I said what it was to the audience, they were all sniggering. So I think I was set up a little bit there, but it's the most horrible timber to, to turn purely because the f minute I made the first cut, the tool clogged immediately. It was so fibrous. So anything like that, really. Some of the palms can be a bit of an issue because they're quite um, sort of like black palmyra, for instance. They're very, very um, splintery. Um, and it will blunt the tools quite quickly as well. So those sorts of materials, anything soft and punky, I don't, I'm not overly keen on, you know. All right, good. Well there, well, there we are. We better end with this one on test. I'll spin it for you, hopefully first time. There we are, it works. So we have a, another working spinning top that, uh, that we can play with. So there we are guys, thank you very much as usual for spending the time and visiting us, watching us on um, Woodworking Wisdom. Um, join me on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, we're going to look at playing with the beading tool a little bit more. Um, we're going to decorate the outside of a bowl and, and see how it can work on there. So something being used on a faceplate instead of uh, between centers. So thanks again. Thanks for joining us. I've been Colwyn. Um, see you again next Tuesday. Bye-bye.